All right. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, this is a first in a weekly series on helping to um, educate uh, buyers in the Bay Area, on the San Francisco Bay Area, on buying a home. And um, every week we will uh, tackle a, a timely topic that we've been hearing about from our clients around San Francisco, things like um, can self-employed buyers get a loan? Um, what's it like to try to buy a home while you're selling another? What does a bridge loan look like? What's new in 2023? Topics like that. So Christine and I, uh, we work at Compass. My name is Mary McPherson. We've invited our friend and our go-to loan agent, Stephen Barber, with Guaranteed Rate to help us answer these burning questions. Um, so again, uh, really quick introductions around the room. I'm Mary McPherson. I'm with Compass Real Estate. Um, and please, uh, Chris, go ahead and take it away. Hi, I'm Chris Ersfeld. I'm with Compass as well and work with Mary on her team representing buyers. Shall we launch into questions for Stephen about self-employed? Great. Uh, first one is we'd like to know which banks offer mortgage loans to self-employed buyers. Sure. Um, first of all, the, the quick answer is all banks. You know, we, we, you know, all banks have to accept uh, applications from everyone. Yeah, there has to be fairness as far as lending. Uh, the other way to ask the question is like, what kind of loan programs do different banks offer? First, it's important to understand who is a self-employed borrower. And basically, if you own 25% or more of the business where you work, you're technically self-employed, even though you may not feel like it. Um, and all banks are going to treat you as self-employed. Um, basically, uh, banks will offer mortgages where they're using two years of your tax returns to qualify. Some banks will use just one year tax return if that's more advantageous because maybe last year is better than the previous year. And then there are some banks that offer bank statement loans as well, where we don't use tax returns at all. We use uh, just your bank statements and the deposits on your bank statements. Uh, and I happen to do all three of those options at Guaranteed Rate. All right, Stephen, uh, my turn. Um, documentation, what kind of documentation is required uh, for a self-employed borrower? Sure. Like, so if, you know, if you and your spouse are applying and your spouse is just uh, a W-2 employee, uh, the spouse is just going to be asked for pay stubs and W-2s, but because you're self-employed, you're going to be asked for more. You're going to be asked for two years tax returns, and you're going to be asked for probably a profit and loss, depending on what time of the year it is as well. Um, you're going to have to show your uh, personal bank statements, and you're probably going to also need to show your business bank statements and some sort of proof of self-employment, like if you have a business license or have a CPA write a letter confirming your self-employed status. Thank you. Another uh, question that I would love to know the answer to, how do the rates compare? Are they different for self-employed buyers? Typically, no. If, if you are able to qualify on the standard documentation, which is like two years tax returns, you're going to see the same rates. And even if like one of you is self-employed and you're, you and your spouse and one is self-employed and one is not, we're just going to use your combined income and you're going to get the same rates as if you are both uh, W-2 employees. The only time where you're going to see a uh, premium in the interest rate is if we have to use alternative documentation, such as like the bank statement loan, they are inherently more risky as far as Wall Street's concerned and risk equates to interest rate. Hmm. Um, are there difference in down payment requirements for someone who's self-employed? Not really. Um, I was just doing a bank statement loan for somebody over Christmas and they're only putting like 15% down. So um, they should be able to see the same kind of down payment uh, requirements. The only time the down payment um, gets more restrictive and higher is if we get into really high purchase prices. Typically, the bigger the purchase price, the bank wants more skin in the game. Or if we start getting into units like two, three, four units, typically banks want more skin in the game as well for down payment. So, Stephen, you know, just overall and maybe even anecdotally, is it pretty easy for a self-employed buyer to get a loan on a home in San Francisco or in the Bay Area? And, and what kind of clients are you working with right now um, in that realm? Sure. I would say it is as easy as if 
you are, you know, a straight salary W-2 person. It's just a matter of, it may take some more effort. It may take some more research um, for one. Uh, so for instance, if you were to just go into, uh, I'll give you a quick example. Um, so I had a client that just went into B of A um, and they're an architect. They do like a, a specific type of architecture that had some difficulties during uh, COVID, right? So they went to B of A. B, B of A is like, okay, give us two years tax returns. That's all we use. And B of A came up with the following. They came up with, is that backwards? I don't know. Seven, <laughs> 7K net income, which basically qualified them for 425000 Well, that's not going to work. They want to buy some place for like, uh, you know, a million plus for them. So then uh, I started working with them and said, okay, obviously the two years, two years of tax returns are not working. What if we use one year tax return? Because last year was better than the previous year. In that case, we came up with $12,000 a month in income. So we got them up to almost 700. So we're getting there. Um, but, you know, they really wanted the place. They're paying a lot in rent right now. They wanted to buy the place that they are living in. The landlord's selling it. They wanted to buy it for like a million plus. So we did the bank statement loan. The last 12 months of their bank statements for this architecture firm are great. We had $94,000 on average of monthly deposits. We hit them with like a 50% expense ratio and wham, bam, we have $47,000 in qualified income to use. Did they qualify for that million dollar mortgage? All day long. Rates a little higher, but they really wanted to buy a place and it made sense for them. Um, Self-employed borrowers have to think of the process as more like triage where you go to the hospital, like, and you're not sure what kind of care you need. Like, do you go, need to go to the emergency room or as an outpatient? That's how I treat self-employed borrowers. Like, I'm like, okay, let's start with the low hanging fruit. Let's try two years tax returns. This is what it's getting you. Does that work for you? No. Okay, let's pivot. Let's try this. So uh, as opposed to like a B of A, I'm going to have those different options. I'm going to go through the triage of different options to show them how they can get to the purchase price they want in case they have been heavy on expenses, which most Americans do on their tax returns. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we don't want to pay income tax. So we, we lob on the expenses to show lower net income. That's a double-edged sword because you're saving on income tax, but you're kind of screwing the pooch on buying a property. So in like in summary about that kind of thing, or just to put it simply, you can do a bank statement loan, you know, a bank statement based loan for a self-employed borrower. What would what would a credit score have to look like on something like that? Uh, it would help that it was over 680. Hmm. But I mean, it, all is possible. Um, it doesn't have to have a, a certain credit score. It has to be at least over 620. But um, pricing will be better on the interest rate if you can get in the 700s. Assuming this is a jumbo loan and stuff like that, typically jumbo loans like better FICO scores. So if we have a, if we have a buying client and they have a decent credit score, good bank statements, other things might be a little shaky. Chances are they're probably going to still qualify for a loan. Um, it maybe paying a little higher rate. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times when a self-employed borrower comes to me, maybe like that at that time, they're not perfectly groomed, but they're like fitting the box perfectly. I don't expect any kind of client to be like a perfect borrower on day one when they come in. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time to groom them and work with them on their profile, whether, you know, work with them on their credit score, work with them on the bank statements to make sure they're showing more consistent deposits if they have control over that, because they don't know what the rules are before they show up to me. So I, I explain the rules and kind of groom them to, uh, be prepared, just kind of like a celebrity date analyst, like when they get those bachelors and they're grooming them for that next date. <laughs> That's great, Stephen. Thank you. Um, I always have a million questions, but let me turn it over to you guys. Anybody have a question for Stephen Barber? I have a quick question. So you've touched on how long you need to be self-employed and you've mentioned a year's worth of tax returns or two years or bank statements loans. Is there a bare minimum of time for self-employment before a bank will lend? 12 months. It's a really good question. So 12 months is what we need because um, th that would be either a one year's tax return um, or 12 months of bank statements. And the philosophy behind that is, as you all know, self-employed self -employed borrowers, self-employed people have variable income. So philosophically, an underwriter says, hey, I need to average something. I can't just like look at somebody's pay stub 
like a W-2 person say, hey, that's much, how much money they make because they're not W-2, you're variable self-employed. So we need some sort of working average and the minimal working average would be 12 months. Great, thank you. Of course. Other questions? How does like, you know, the mattress money qualify and that sort of thing, just uh, seeing bank deposits here and there, does that make any difference, Stephen, yeah, or do you have to explain? Oh. So the, oh, yeah. the, um, the bank deposits have to be somewhat consistent. So if you had okay. a tremendous amount of mattress money or wherever that money is, and you all of a sudden like your deposits are doubling, tripling, quadrupling, um, that's going to be, there is going to be a question mark for them, mm -hmm. but there are, there are many ways of introducing mattress money, typically by giving the money to like a relative and having them give you a mm -hmm. gift in escrow mm -hmm. is typically the way that you can legitimize that money. Mm -hmm. Um, to bring it into a transaction. And mm -hmm. a lot of times it's just cultural where um, people will have money that's not in a bank uh, account. So um, there, there are workarounds to help with that because it obviously exists. Mm -hmm. Stephen, um, some more questions. It's tax time. Do you recommend reducing expenses to show higher income for 2022 to qualify? And do you need to back up revenue with bank deposits? Yeah, for somebody that for somebody that thinks that uh, they're on like the uh, on the brink of qualifying, maybe they were coming out of COVID and things were kind of a little tough, but they you know things have been progressing. What they what I always suggest is that as you're preparing the tax return, just send me the draft before you file, and I will tell them like off the net income after your expenses what they'll qualify for, so they they can even know that like a pro kind of a pro forma before they commit to it. And I'll be like, and I do the same thing for people that have rental real estate. Sometimes people that have properties that are, are on their schedule E as rentals are pretty heavy handed on showing expenses and showing huge losses. And I will work with them as well in like maybe showing a bunch of depreciation, but not other kinds of expenses. So we can try to have those properties at least break even or show a little bit of a profit if they're dragging them down. So I kind of do that pro forma draft situation with people all the time. And if anyone is working with a bank, they should try to do that with a loan officer before they kind of commit on the dotted line on what they want to file for 2022. Oh, thank you. Another question, do appraisers on rental income properties need to do a market analyst analysis of market rent and do they actually check on if the rental is rented so if it's a subject property if it's a property we're lending on the appraiser will go in and find out obviously if it's occupied it'll be clear it's occupied if it's occupied they'll use the actual tenants actual rent um, if it is vacant then they have to go and do a market analysis of um market rents and come up with a figure there for them as well. Um, the other interesting thing that's is just starting to happen now is that there is a um, tool that some lenders are using, which is called Air DNA, And it is a predictive income model for Airbnb rental on a property. If the area has a healthy Airbnb rental, and the property is going to be used for short-term rentals. You can I can go to this one source and use they they'll have the appraiser use this Air DNA quote for what the proposed Airbnb rental will be. And as you can imagine, sometimes that could be double, triple what long-term rent like a twelve-month lease could look like. Wow. Okay. Uh, another question: um, How does short-term rental income factor in and is air dna available to the rental owner it is, it is and it's a bank it's a bank um uh program that they'll run um if uh if people are if people are reporting their income on the tax return regardless if the renter's in there for a week or for months at a time rent rent is rent it's the, what, the top line figure that's going to be used in the analysis of income minus expenses for them. If the property is um, vacant um, and the appraiser is projecting rent, the, the golden rule and what's used by 99% of banks is 
a long-term rent analysis, assuming what's what are rents going for for similar properties for a 12-month lease. This air DNA thing is kind of brand new, just starting to test the waters. And I think it will become probably more prevalent um, as we try it more, but it's something I literally found out about like this week. Wonderful, thank you. Any last questions for Stephen before we let him go? No? Okay, um, so this will be a weekly series. Um, next week, we'll be talking about loans for medical professionals. So if you know someone or you are a medical in the medical field, doctor, nurse, et cetera, um, Stephen's got a loan program for you. Um, we'll talk about what's new in 2023. We'll talk about loans for investors. We'll talk about bridge loans. Do you have a property that you'd like to buy, but you, you're sitting on something that you need to sell? How do you, how do you get around that? How, what's the workaround? Um, how does, what does that look like? So Stephen's got lots of information and um, ah, another question. Let's see. Also for medical professionals in the biotech science um, realm, Stephen, does that, do they qualify for the medical? Pretty much everyone qualifies. They would have to, they will have to have gone to some sort of medical school, but like vet, vets, ophthalmologists, dentists, nurses, the, the list is, uh, the anesthesiologists, the list is very long. Um, uh, it would be difficult for somebody not to qualify for it, I would think. That's great. That's great. Um, so Christine and I and Kathleen, people on this call, we've used and, and gone to Stephen for advice, counsel, loans for many, many, many years. And I would highly recommend, you know, it's always hard to take the plunge and make a phone call or reach out to a loan agent, a real estate agent, but please see us as resources for information, not necessarily someone who's going to, you know, drag you down the altar to buy a house. That's not the point. The point is to try to educate you on, on, you know, making some informed decisions well, with regard to Bay Area real estate. So Stephen Barber, guaranteed rate. Thank you so much for joining us this week. And uh, we'll be back again next Thursday at 1230. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.